Well, this is Resurrection Sunday. That's a better name for it than Easter. This is Resurrection Day. As a matter of fact, every Sunday is Resurrection Day for the Christians. That's the reason why believers from the very beginning of the church have met on Resurrection Day, the first day of the week, as a reminder that now something new has come. But there'll be people who are meeting and think of this day or look at it from a distance and their view of the resurrection is something very different. For some, it's a myth. It is something that people who were primitive and didn't understand the realities of modern life looked back on and didn't quite understand. And, and uh, they, they look on this day as just a day in which people remember an old superstition. There's others for whom Easter Sunday is a kind of metaphor. That is, Christ didn't really rise from the dead, but the early Christians tried to find a way of expressing it. And sadly, in many churches, even as they meet together, they will hear things like, as one famous uh, progressive theologian says, Jesus' earthly followers felt his presence strongly, as strongly after death as though it were still a physical presence. In other words, Jesus rose into their memory and they kept alive the remembrance of him. You know, when you think about that, if he just did die and that's all, I remember my aunt who loved my mother and they were very close together and my mother had died and and her older sister was talking to me one day and she said, you know, I don't know whether it's right or not, but I talked to Patty, that was my mother's sort of name that she went by. I I, I talked to Patty every morning. And I think, Nancy, that's not what the gospel's all about. But nevertheless, somebody else has said, The resurrection and Easter Sunday morning is that we can reach the lowest parts of our life of going deep into a place that feels like death and then find our way out again. That's the story a resurrection now tells me. Well, I'm glad it's not the story a resurrection tells me because that's not worth getting out of bed on a Sunday morning for. We come here this morning not to celebrate a metaphor and not to remember a myth. We come here to celebrate Something that happened in history, a historical truth that changes not only history but eternity for those who know and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That we celebrate something that really happened in time and space and dramatically changed. Those first followers of Jesus who were this morning celebrating as that first Easter morning, we're walking out of the city when a stranger came new to them and they talked about the various things that had happened and we, they said all they could say was, we used to hope that he was the one who would deliver Israel. We, we used to hope. But when they realized it was the living Christ, hope was a living hope because it's based on a living Lord and a living Savior. And these people just didn't have Jesus arise in their hearts He was so real to them that 11 of the 12 disciples who'd followed Jesus gave their lives. The other one ended up in political exile on a remote island because they were convinced that there was a truth that was real. I was struck by that this week as I was thinking on it. We've been following all the stuff and I'm not getting into the political thing related to President Trump and the things around them. But I was struck this morning by the thought that It was a year and a half ago that the man who's now in prison, Michael Cohen, who was his lawyer, said, "Uh, I will be loyal to President Trump. I'm willing to take a bullet for him. And then when he was in danger of going to trial, he turned and did, I was blind loyalty, and he told everything he possibly could that would demean President Trump. Now, I'm not talking about the politics and whether it's right or wrong, but the interesting thing, when his life was on the line, people don't carry on with a myth. They don't carry on with something that they think might be true. They seek their own best interests. But all of the disciples who'd met the risen Christ went to death, preaching Christ is risen because he changed everything about life. So this morning, I want to think with you about the resurrection, not so much that it happened, which is glorious tree true, but what it means, what its significance is. Easter matters. And in what way does it matter? A few weeks ago, or actually about two months ago, we were doing a series on the miracles of the Lord Jesus. And as we ended that series, 
uh, I, I preached a message on the evidence for the resurrection and the reality of the resurrection. So in a certain sense, I'm going to assume that this morning. And if you want to look at that again, you can go back and get on the uh, internet a copy of that particular sermon and listen to it. But I want you to think with me about what difference it makes. And we're going to do it in a different way. This morning, normally it would be my pattern of going to a passage of scripture and walking our way through it. But this morning, I'd like you to turn to the book of Romans. And in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul refers specifically to the resurrection six times. And I just want you to look at each of these six times with me. Obviously, we're not going to be able to mine these passages in any depth. But they are all interesting ways in which we're told that Easter matters. So we'll begin in the very first words of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul begins, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's a short little statement that's just full of all kinds of different things, but let me just notice a few of them with you. Paul is talking about the gospel, and you'll notice that in verse 1. He's set apart for the gospel of God, and he begins to talk about the gospel. The word gospel simply means good news, and it was used in a major way to announce a military victory, a triumph. In the Roman world, it was when the emperor had conquered some new area, or some glorious event. So it is news about an event that has happened that has consequences. But this is the good news that comes from God. And Paul wants to say, this good news that comes from God is not new news. As a matter of fact, it was promised beforehand by the, and the prophets and scriptures. In other words, God had announced ahead of time what was going to happen. And so we could go back and find our way through the Old Testament in all of the places where what happened on Easter weekend, Good Friday, and the resurrection in the morning was predicted, on Easter Sunday morning was predicted in that particular way. But the center of it, Paul wants us to understand, is the gospel of God is about his son. So he says three things about him. First of all, Jesus was the son of God. He was God the Son. He was uniquely related to God and the mystery that we do not fully understand. But he is God himself. And yet God himself took on human flesh. He became someone in the line of David. So it goes on to say, who was descended from David according to the flesh. Now, what he's saying there is God had made a promise way back in the time of King David, a thousand years before Jesus was born, that someone from the line of David was going to fulfill the promises of God. So D Jesus was a real human being who could trace his ancestry back to King David. By the time that he came along, there was no great resonance. There had not been a king from the line of David for centuries but he was physically related to David. He was qualified physically to be the fulfillment of the promises. But then he says in the next verse, he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the working of the Holy Spirit, by his resurrection from the dead. In other words, what Paul is saying is the resurrection confirms the identity of Christ. It is by his emergence from death that we know him to be not just someone in the line of David, but someone who is the son of God. And now, although the times in his life were the times of weakness, epitomized by hanging on a cross, he is now the son of God with power. And so he is risen from the dead. He has conquered death. How do we know who Jesus is? It is because he rose from the dead in fulfillment of his own predictions. I will be crucified on the third day. I will rise again. 
and on the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament, he is confirmed to be unique. He is the God-man. The risen Lord is the Son of God with power. And for Christians who believe in that, you notice the title he uses at the end. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Paul wants us to understand the resurrection confirms the identity of Christ. Now turn with me to chapter 4. In chapter 4, he is going to refer again to the resurrection. And this is in the middle of a discussion about how we get right with God. A discussion about faith and what faith is and what faith does. So you'll notice he's been talking about Abraham in uh, chapter 4. We could begin to read it, verse 22. It says, that is why Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. And he's referring to Genesis chapter 12. But for ours also, faith will be counted to us who believe in him as righteousness, he means, who raised from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now what Paul is wrestling with there and what we need to wrestle with is that there is no doubt that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. How could someone who is God's king be crucified? And what does it mean? What, what, what was his death all about? Was it a, a massive miscarriage of justice by the authorities who were trying to keep their own place? Was it something he personally deserved? Does it have any meaning at all, other than maybe as a noble martyrdom or as an act of example? What, what does the cross mean? And we have to recognize if Jesus had been crucified on the cross and buried, and that was the end, the idea was, well, that would be sad. It would be on the level of the death of Socrates or something of that particular nature. Of, of people who didn't understand. But the Christian claim is that, as Paul puts in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Christ died for our sins. Paul says it here in verse 25. He was delivered up for our transgressions, our sins. Christians claim that the death of Jesus was not an ordinary death. It was a substitutionary death. He was taking our place. He was taking my penalty. He was taking my guilt. But if death was the end, there would be no sense in which we could make any sense of that. And so Paul says here, he was delivered up for our transgressions and he was raised again for our justification. In other words, the resurrection clarifies the cross. We understand that the cross was not an act of martyrdom. It was not an act of injustice, although those things were maybe involved in it. It was God's act, his way of having the penalty of our sins paid. And when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it was God saying yes to Christ's statement, it is finished, that he's paid the penalty for our sins. He's completed everything that was done. And the very essence of the idea of justification and I don't have time to go in this, one of the great biblical words. Justification means we are declared righteous by the God of heaven, not on the basis of our righteousness, but on the basis of the work of Christ. And at the heart of justification is the idea that we are united to Christ. To be united to a dead Christ would do us no good where you're united to the living Christ. And so the resurrection is inseparable from the cross. We often talk, and every Sunday morning, we come and we will this morning to this table where we remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to remember that the death of Christ has meaning only because of the resurrection of Christ. And we remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. So when we say we are cross-centered, we're really not saying we're cross-centered. We're saying we're 
cross-centered because the resurrection is inseparable from the cross. All of those things link together. So, what does the resurrection does? It clarifies the cross. It helps me to see that it's just not some massive tragedy or some terrible misjustice. It explains this was God providing so that I could be forgiven and I could have new life. That leads us to the next verse, chapter 6 and verse 4. Now again, we're intruding into a discussion. And in this discussion, Paul is using symbolism. And he's using the symbolism of baptism. Now when a person is baptized, they are, as it were, stand, placed under the water, and brought back out of the water again. And the New Testament uses that as a symbol because it's as if there's Gary and Rig, and by going under the water, Gary and Rig dies. By coming out of the water, there's a new Gary and Rig, forgiven before God, standing as his child. Now, it isn't baptism that saves us. It is faith and trust in Christ. But baptism symbolizes and expresses that faith. Now, Paul uses that language, and you'll have to bear with me with some of that, and comes in verse 4. Uh, in verse four. Well, let's read verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if you, we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, you notice what Paul is doing about resurrection there. He's saying that there's two ways in which the resurrection symbols what God does in our life when we put our faith and trust in him. The first thing is that we are raised with him into newness of life. So that now I am a Christ follower and I have a new identity as a Christ follower and there is newness of life. In Paul's term, that means the ability to live with God's power present in me because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit who comes to live within my life. So that it isn't simply that I put my faith in Jesus and my sins are forgiven. It is that God now enables me to increasingly live a life that honors and pleases him. There's a new capacity, a new opportunity to live a different kind of life than I live in, I've lived before. And some of you can give witness to the fact that I trusted in Christ and everything about the direction of my life began to change. For some of us, it isn't quite as dramatic like that. Perhaps we were brought up in Christian families and, and uh, the newness of life doesn't immediately show, but there's this reality that the resurrection is to give us newness of life now and the promise of resurrection and new life forever with him. So that's where verse 5 takes us. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And the promise for every believer is that death is not the end. Now the reality is he's talking here about our bodies and our physical bodies and our bodies will be raised and we will have a resurrection body like the Lord's resurrection body. But the promise is because also we are new people in Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, that's closely connected to the next verse we're going to look at. So, Easter matters because it confirms the identity of Christ as Son of God. Easter matters because it clarifies the cross as God's means of dealing with our sin. Easter matters because it enables us to live in newness of life. And this next verse is pretty similar, but Easter, lives, Easter matters because it confirms our destiny. So notice in chapter 8 and in verse 11 he says if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead 
will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now what he's saying there, and and again, we're packing a, a lot of things into just a short particular place, but what Paul is saying is because Christ promised before he went to heaven that if I go away, I will send another helper to you. And the promise is the moment a Christian trusts in the Lord Jesus, God's Spirit in a mysterious way comes to live within us. So Paul has said earlier in verse uh, 9 or 10 of this passage, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. So every Christian has the Holy Spirit coming to live within them. So Paul says, since that's true, since the resurrection has taken place and the Lord Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to us, If the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. The spirit of God, in other words, it was God who raised Christ from the dead. If the spirit lives within you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, God the Father, will give life to your body through his spirit who lives within us. So this is reconfirming what was said in in chapter 6. That the certainty that life does not end is grounded in the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember what he said to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. That's the promise that if I believe in Christ, I live on. And he who lives and believes in me will never, ever die. So that is both the reality that My innate being lives on in the presence of God at death and my resurrection body is a promise for me when the Lord Jesus returns in glory. So, Easter matters because the resurrection guarantees the destiny of those who trust in Him. Number five, Easter matters because it is a basis of the security of my salvation in Christ. Now, it's the end of chapter 8. And since this is my favorite passage in the New Testament, we're only going to be basically looking at verse 34, but this is too good a passage not to read the whole thing. Verse 31. Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, and that's thinking about the cross and all that's involved in the cross, but gave him up for us all, again thinking of the cross, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I mean, if he's given us Christ, his son, then he's not going to stop at just doing that. Who will bring any charge against God's elect. It is God who's declared us righteous. So what court do you appeal to higher than God? There is no supreme court above the supreme being. So if he's declared us righteous, that settles it. Who is he who condemns? Who is to condemn? Condemn looks at all the weaknesses and failings and shortcomings that you have as a Christ follower. Who is it who will condemn? Well, there's lots of people who are willing to say, you're a Christian and you did that. Not that we should have done it. But the promise is that God has paid provision even for our shortcomings and our weaknesses. And it is in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. He paid the penalty of our sins. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. So what Paul wants us to understand at this particular point is that we live with all of our weakness and human frailty. We are genuinely new in Christ, but we're not completely new and won't be until the resurrection. And so we're going to fall short and all of these other things are going to come into being. But Satan and even our own consciences and other people, their condemnation has no significance before God. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 8 began with the word, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is that? 
Because Christ Jesus, who died and paid the full penalty of my sin, who rose again, who's ascended to heaven, who's at the right hand of the Father, is praying for me. He's interceding me for me. He's representing me before the Father. And my ability to be in heaven is not dependent on my well-being. It is dependent on having the Lord Jesus representing me before the Father. Paul will say in chapter 5 or said in chapter 5 and verse 10 that having been justified by his life, how much more shall, by having been declared righteous by his death, how much more shall we not be saved by his life? Jesus lives for you as surely as he died for you. And he is their high priest in heaven. He always lives to make intercession for us, as the writer of Hebrews says. So he is here referring to the fact that I am kept by the power of God. He saved me by his death and resurrection. He saves me by his resurrection life. And that's why he goes on to end in this marvelous statement. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, uh, pardon me, shall uh, tribulation or distress or person, uh, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being put to death all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more, more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We used to sing a chorus. It went like this, for me he lived, for me he died, and everlasting life and life he freely gives. And that's the promise of the gospel. So the resurrection of Christ not only clarifies the cross, it secures my safety if I've trusted in him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, and I give to them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will pluck them out of my hand. Easter matters because it confirms the identity of Christ. Easter matters because it clarifies the cross of Christ. Easter matters because it empowers and enables newness of life. Easter matters because it ensures our ongoing resurrection life. Easter matters because it guarantees our destiny Easter matters because Christ secures us in his salvation. And the final passage on resurrection in Romans chapter 10 is one that many of us have heard, but it falls into the center of what he's saying here. In verse 9, he says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, declared righteous. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. What was the essence of the meaning of Easter weekend, of Good Friday, and the resurrection? It is that God is going to declare righteous certain kinds of people. He's going to save certain kinds of people. But Paul wants us to understand it isn't people who've earned it, who've merited it, who've kept the law of God or the rules and opinions of men. It is people who've learned one simple great reality. Christ has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And he is who no one else is. If we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. That, that means more than simply saying he's really important. In this passage, he will go on to quote the Old Testament. says, when whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he's quoting the Old Testament and clearly that's the Lord God, Yahweh. To come to Christ is to confess that he is God become man that he is Lord in the fullest 
possible ways. But related to the fact that he is Lord, and you cannot confess that he is Lord unless you confess that he is risen from the dead. That he, God raised him as a demonstration of who he was. And all we're here, we go all the way back to the very first words of the book, that he is confirmed to be son of God with power according to his resurrection from the dead by the spirit of holiness. It is because Christ is risen from the dead that his cross has meaning for us. So Paul has earlier talked about the cross and he said, when we were out of strength at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But he also rose again for us. And so when we put our faith and trust in Christ, when we believe in our hearts, not just as a verbal affirmation, but we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now for the early Christians and for us today, that was closely related to the idea that we'd go back to chapter 6 where people were baptized in declaration that I am a follower of the Lord Jesus. I have trusted him. It wasn't going through a ritual that gave them new life, but that was God's way of confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is my Lord, my Savior. I am following him. I'm living under his orders. Easter matters. It Easter matters because it's true. Christ has risen from the dead. But it matters because of all of the things that come out of it. We could go on to all kinds of other things. Paul will stand in front of another group of people and say, you know, you need to understand this. God is going to judge every human person. And he's given witness to this by raising Jesus from the dead. So the resurrection also tells us that one day I will stand and I will give an account of my life to Jesus Christ, God the Son. He is Lord. He is judge. But when I look at the resurrection, I begin to realize that it gives me confidence. I know who Jesus is. It, it clarifies the cross. I understand what happened. Christ died for my sins. He paid my penalty. And the resurrection shows that God accepted what he had done. The resurrection makes it possible for me to live a new kind of life in obedience to God instead of just rebellion against him because of what he's done in my heart. And when it comes to ultimate things like life and death, he's given me the promise of resurrection and the certainty that he will keep me in his hands. But it comes back to this. Easter apart from my personal bowing the knee in faith and trust to the Lord Jesus, stands as judgment against me rather than God's grace toward me. There's an urgency about Easter. And that is, if this is who Jesus is and this is what he has done, I can't be indifferent to him. I need to respond to him. So if you're here this morning and you're not sure that you have believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Make your way up afterwards and talk to one of the elders. They're here to pray with you, but also to talk with you about the most important things that matter in life. Make sure that you know your relationship to Jesus. And if you've trusted him, if you know he is Lord, then you come around the Lord's table and you take these symbols and, and you think of those Emmaus disciples who met with him and all of a sudden they sat it down with meal with him and all that simply says is we knew who it was and the breaking of bread. But we, when we shared a meal with him, we, we knew who he was. And that's what this table is a way in which as Christ followers we come and we share in worship and gratitude and praise of the Lord Jesus. This is the symbol Jesus gave to his people on the night he was betrayed. And he said, keep on doing this in remembrance of me. It's a, an action that looks back 
to the cross, but it also looks forward to his coming. And it looks upward to our Lord in heaven as we see who he is even now. This is not the table of Redeemer Fellowship. It's the table of the Lord Jesus. And if you've trusted him, he invites you to take of these symbols in gratitude and outpoured praise in your heart. We're going to sing a hymn as we take these symbols that celebrates our Lord. We'll distribute the elements. And then after we've sung, I'll lead us in taking these symbols. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for wrapping yourself into a human nature, not just a human body, for becoming one with us. Thank you for taking on yourself my sin, our sin. We know the Father made you to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in you. Pray for those who've never confessed and believed in their heart about you as Lord and as the risen one. So as we take these symbols, write these truths in our heart in new and fresh ways, our living Lord and Savior. In your name we give thanks. Amen.